So in case you guys don't know, for some reason, we are going to get new Hunter Hunter chapters fairly soon. I'm not sure when exactly, but they are releasing the next volume in September, which is the previous or the last 10 chapters that we received about two years ago at this point. And usually manga companies, they like to coincide new chapters with the release of a volume. So it would make sense that if he's been working on new chapters and there's a new volume in September, very, very likely we are getting new chapters, although it's not confirmed yet as to when. I also think as Tagashi is working on these chapters, he's probably going to release about 10 at a time, which is the length of a volume. That's how many that he released the last time that he came out with some new chapters and then he took a break as well because in case, again, if you guys don't know for some reason, he deals with very debilitating back pain which put him out of commission uh, time and time again. At one point it was so bad that like he couldn't even get on and off the toilet, just like horrendous stuff. And so the fact that he's even attempting to work at all and create new chapters is just uh, a, a, you know, a miracle in itself. And I'll appreciate anything that we get from him. I don't know if Hunter Hunter will ever officially complete. I think that this might be the norm from now on. We might get him working on 10 chapters, one volume at a time. Every couple of years, we get 10 chapters, and that's the most progress we're going to get into the story for as long as he can possibly make chapters. And if that's the case, that's fine with me as well. I'll take whatever I can get. I'll be happy with it. But since Hunter Hunter is coming back soon, I figured I would make another Hunter Hunter video. It's been a while, and I thought of a topic that's not just Hunter Hunter, but Tagashi based. Because when it comes to Yoshihiro Tagashi's writing, I truly think this man is a master at crafting antagonists and villains. You know, I'm not going to say that Tagashi has created the best villain of all time in, you know, in fiction or media or anything like that. You can point to other manga examples, you know, Griffith, Johan, other manga examples that have villains that are like the creme de la creme stand up on the pedestal that almost nobody can match. However, I don't know of any other mangaka or writer that I can think of off the top of my head that have had the consistency when it comes to writing villains. As in just banger after banger after banger. So many characters that are deep, complex, emotional, uh, morally ambiguous, just entertaining as all hell. Whether they are completely evil for evil's sake. Whether they just love manipulating a situation. Whether or not they are just this chaotic neutral force that you can just throw into any situation and they can turn things upside down. Whether or not they're a parallel to the main character. Whatever the case may be. Tagashi has crafted so many iconic villains. And as you saw the title of this video, this is a top 10 list. And even coming up with 10 was difficult. And I am going to cheat with some of these numbers so I can include some more characters. But that's the thing that I'm talking about. If you can make 10 just amazing, captivating villains, like 10 villains that just on their own could be the number one villain of an entire series, and he's managed to make more than 10 of them, that is just incredible to me. I think that he's a fantastic writer overall, but most particularly when it comes to his antagonists and when it comes to his villains, uh, I think Tagashi is pretty much number one. Like I said, I don't think he's created the ultimate best villain in manga, but if you're going with an overall collective of like, uh, all of the villains that he's created combined together. I don't think anybody's done it like Tagashi has. And so this is going to be my tribute to his villains or to his antagonists, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to give you my top 10 throughout both Hunter x Hunter and Yu Yu Hakusho. At the number 10 spot, I'm going to put Illumi. And Illumi is only down at number 10 mostly because he hasn't had much of a chance to be the prime antagonist of the series, and he's mostly only an antagonist to Killua. But that doesn't exempt him from being an amazingly written character. In fact, Killua's entire family, I love the dynamic of every character in that family, from Silva to uh, Kaluto to all of the different characters and how they relate to Killua especially, but uh, Illumi has this power, this control, this presence over Kilua that has, you know, corrupted his mind from an early age, both literally and figuratively, and put him into a state of inferiority, a state of panic, being able to literally control him multiple times, and just the amount of trauma and abuse that uh, Illumi put down onto Kilua, you know, not allowing him to have friends, making sure that he only follows the family business, and just the uh, the pure selfishness that he has when it comes to um, 
Alaka, you know, later on in the series. And also just his persona, too. Just the way that he carries himself is just a very intimidating thing. And then not to mention he's friends with people like Hisoka. Like, if you if you could call Hisoka a friend, or at least the closest thing to, um, you're already in a bad camp, a bad category. Like, the fact that those two can even interact and, you know, have a solid conversation back and forth and have it not be completely weird all the time. Um, and now he is technically a member of the Phantom Troop as well. So, Illumi has more to do in the series. Um, it's just, he's the only reason he's number 10 is because he's pretty much mostly an antagonist for Kilua specifically. But I do think that's going to change as time goes on. And my number 9 spot, also down lower in the list, just simply because we haven't had enough of him yet. But I'm going to say Periston from Hunter x Hunter. He is the guy that's within the Hunter Association association that just loves fucking things up the best that he can in order to make people absolutely despise him. He's the kind of guy that lies with the truth. You know, he lies with a smile on his face. He'll make things progressively more difficult if he can. He's just this smug motherfucker that's just like, you know, perfect for the position of being in politics. You know, if the Hunter Association is politics, you know, the election arc in Hunter x Hunter, Pariston is the perfect guy for that. In the manga, uh, we get a couple more scenes with him, and he goes into kind of an explanation about how he loves making people hate him. Like, basically getting off on the fact that he's such a miserable <laughs> he's such a miserable prick, uh, but he does it all with a smile on his face and all with the guise of, you know, him trying to be helpful, which makes him even more intimidating. And uh, it seems like he's being set up to be a prime antagonist for Gene. So hopefully if we get past the succession war and we get back into the Gene storyline, Periston will have a much bigger role. My number eight is one that I think is very underrated in Tagashi's catalog and doesn't get talked about enough, and that is Yomi from Yu Yu Hakusho. Yomi is technically the final antagonist of Yu Yu Hakusho, unless you count the manga, goes a little bit further, talking about King Enma and all that kind of stuff. But in the, uh, in the anime, or at least in the arc of the Three Kings, uh, Yomi is the final villain. And... I think just because, again, Tagashi has so many great villains and also Yu Hakusho has two more villains that are better than Yomi, that Yomi gets the shit end of the stick and people forget that he is also a great, full, well-rounded character. I love his backstory of being this bandit that gets blinded by his own arrogance, figuratively and literally, and then has to rise to power over that. And I love, I love that kind of character arc where you take somebody and you break them down to the farthest that they can possibly go, and then they have that journey of rising up to the very top. And although his rise to the top is mostly through exposition and just kind of telling you in a backstory, we don't get to go along that journey with him, I still like the concept, I like the story in itself. And also, he is technically the final antagonist of Yu Hakusho in the anime, and his fight with Yusuke is fucking awesome. Like, I think that is one of the best fights in the entire anime, and it's so underappreciated and it doesn't get talked about enough. It is a great battle. And I always look forward to watching that fight scene when I get to the end of Yu Hakusho. Every time I rewatch it, every time Yomi steps into the picture and I know that we're going to get that fight of Yusuke and Yomi, I get pumped about it, man. I think it's super underrated and he's a super underrated character. My number seven pick, I'm going to be cheating a little bit because I'm trying to add these characters on here and they all deserve their, their justification, but... Number seven is going to be the royal guards of the Chimera Ants. So we have Neferpito, Yupi, and Poof. And they all have their own individual personality and character arcs that they go on. So it is definitely cheating to put all three here. But if I put all three on the list, then there's more that I can't put on. And it just, uh, you know, I want to be able to talk about all these characters. So they're all great for different reasons. I'd say Poof is the most diabolical you know, with him wanting the king to be a particular image that he sees and doing everything he can to the point of, like, trying to figure out how to kill Kamugi. And watching his kind of sanity break from time to time as he sees the king get more and more human as the arc goes on is just, just uh, fascinating to watch. Uh, Yupi, I think, is also very underrated because he goes on a character arc of kind of learning what it means to be a warrior and to have honor and have respect. His whole, the thing, I think the reason why people don't talk about Yupi as much is because his entire character arc happens through a fight, whereas the other characters kind of happen through the entire arc itself or, you know, they do other things. It's more dialogue based, so it's more, you, you kind of see the character arc a little bit better, whereas Yupi's is all about the battle situation, all of him fighting Knuckle and more and all of those characters and he becomes a very honorable fighter kind of understanding you know the beauty and glory and that these people uh they just have a different point of view and they're fighting their hearts out 
uh, for what they believe is right, which is the same thing that he's doing. And he recognizes that during the process of the fight. And it's a really, really good character arc. Very underappreciated. Neferpito, as well, you know, comes out of the gates being this terrifying cat-like creature that, you know, kills Kite right off the bat. You know, definitely terrifying. And also seeing her arc of caring about the king and wanting to protect Kamugi. And then you kind of have this reversal of roles as Gon gets darker and darker and darker. And, you know, Neferpito is just trying to do what she believes is right. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's all three of them have an amazing character arc. And so, like, I have to include all three of them on the list. The number six spot is going to go to what I would mostly consider to be our current antagonist in the manga. This character has not shown up in the anime yet, but this is Serenich or Serenich, however you pronounce his name. He's one of the Kakin princes within the Succession War. And this guy is fucking terrifying. I think one of the things that makes him so terrifying is because he feels very realistic. Uh, whereas, I mean, most of the characters in Hunter x Hunter are human, but Serenich feels the most like a real life character. Like he feels like Patrick Bateman, <laughs> you know, a little bit. Um, he feels like somebody that would really be out there that comes from privilege. That's part of this rich family that's murdering people behind the scenes. He has this arrogance to him, but he's also so incredibly intelligent. He picks up on things very, very quickly. He's well read. He's well versed. He, uh, he, you know, respects and appreciates art. Like he's very much, uh, you know, living in that luxury to the fullest capacity. And then he discovers that he's going to be part of this succession war where he has to kill off his brothers and sisters. He's like, all right, whatever. And then he learns about Nen, which is equally as terrifying. And he picks up on it so quickly. And he's basically, at this point in the story, locked himself in a room with his bodyguard, who's a woman. And he also, like, hates women and murders them. But he has this affection towards his bodyguard, which is, like, a really creepy dynamic that we got going on. Uh, and he's basically just training as hard as he can to master Nen. And his ability involves a little bit of time travel as well. So, yeah, it's... I can't wait to see where that goes. My number five pick is also going to be cheating. I apologize, but I'm going to put basically the entire Phantom Troop here. Um, and I feel like the Phantom Troop can be collected as one. But again, just Tagashi's writing style when it comes to villains, each of them have their own unique style and unique personality. Um, I could rank them all, you know, I think I actually I think I did make a video where I ranked all of my favorite members. But, you know, Crollo himself, badass. But like what I love about the Phantom Troop is that they are this kind of group of friends, you know, that uh, and, and in the manga recently, we've seen a little bit more of their backstory, which is really cool to see. Uh, but also they're just doing what they think is like they're they're living life with no rules, you know, other than their own. And there's something about that I appreciate. You know, they come from nowhere. They come from a dump, basically. They were essentially a group of theater kids that learned Nen and started murdering people. So um, I love everything about them. I love when they're introduced in York New City and seeing that camaraderie. I love seeing the banter back and forth. I love how all of their personalities bounce off of each other. You have some in the troop that are more evil than others. You have some that are a little bit more lighthearted. You have some that are funnier, you know, and they all work perfectly together. And um, to come up with a dynamic of a group villain, you know, a group of villains is something that's been done, you know, hundreds of times in stories. But the Phantom Troop stands out. Uh, far beyond uh, mostly any other group of villains that I can think of. And they are, without a doubt, one of the most memorable aspects of Hunter x Hunter. Now getting into my top four Tagashi villains at number four. And I, I can't believe he's at number four. But that's just, again, a testament to Tagashi's villains. Number four is going to be Tagoro from Yu Hakusho. So I grew up a Yu Hakusho fan way before I got into Hunter x Hunter. You know, Yu Hakusho is very, very close to my heart. And the first time experiencing the anime was one of the, <laughs> as corny as it sounds, one of the best things in my life. I loved I, waiting for every episode. I was so excited to watch through the Dark Tournament. And at first, Tagoro was just a badass. You know, he was just this hired gun, this like muscle-bound, super strong character. But over the course of the arc, you got a little bit of a taste, a little flavor of what Tagashi was capable of doing with his villains. And uh, giving, Tag giving Tagoro this really tragic backstory of losing everybody that he cared about, wanting to become stronger, never wanting to be weak again, getting rid of his humanity, 
um, and then sort of carrying this regret, but at the same time embracing what he did. Like, I made this choice. This is who I am. Hopefully somebody can show me a different way, but until then, I'm not going to hold back. And, uh, you know, Tagoro is just, uh, again, just a completely memorable character that you'll never forget. Speaking of memorable characters, my number three is going to be Hisoka. He's, what can you say about Hisoka? One of the most creative and unique villains that I have ever seen in anything ever. Like, like Hisoka himself is just a wild card. Like, he, he is purely out for his own gain. He has no real allegiances to anybody. Every allegiance is just temporary, and he is just living his best life, my man. Like, uh, this kind of, like, flamboyant, like, over-the-top you know, magician-esque character with the strangest ability ever, like bungee gum, like what the fuck is that? Um, also his strange sexual preferences of loving to fight and tear people down. I made a whole video about Hisoka's sexuality analyzed. Yeah, I'm the guy that decided to make that video for some reason, but I think I actually did a pretty good job in it. What I love about Hisoka is he's that kind of character that no matter what's happening in the story, if you throw Hisoka in, it literally is like playing the wild card. It's playing the Joker card. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what this guy is going to do. He's completely unpredictable, and he always makes everything better. Everything that's going... Like, there's so many great things in Hunter x Hunter. The whole Chimera Ant arc doesn't even have Hisoka. There's so many great things that happen in the story. But as soon as you add Hisoka, everything just gets a little bit better better. And I love that. My number two villain uh, by Yoshihiro Togashi is going to be Shinobu Sensui from Yu Hakusho. Uh, if you guys have not watched Yu Hakusho, because I know there might be younger fans out there that have uh, gotten into Hunter x Hunter but haven't seen Yu Hakusho, I don't know if I want to necessarily spoil everything that's so great about this character, but essentially what I love about it is that it kind of inverses the original premise of Yu Hakusho, where Yusuke is chosen to be the spirit detective and he fights demons and demons are bad. But as you go through the series, you realize that it's a little bit more ambiguous than that. And since we was a former spirit detective that had this traumatic event happen where he witnessed the darkest aspects of humanity and he saw what humans are capable of in the most depraved, barbaric way possible. And it broke his mind. Like it broke his sanity. He couldn't handle it. And something very significant and unique happens to his mental state because of that, but I don't want to spoil it. But he's also a very, um, you know, powerful character. At the same time, he's very mysterious. He has a lot going on. He's capable of manipulating other people and also his whole group of villains. You know, you could probably add those on the list too. He has a whole like little group of seven uh, as well. But um, I love how he just decides that he's going to eradicate humanity or open up the gates to hell and basically just let everything, everybody fend for themselves. I think one of my favorite lines in the whole series is somebody says that he wants to destroy the world and he's like, I don't want to destroy the world. He's like, I love the world. I love mountains. I love rivers. I love trees. I love birds. I love animals. The only thing I hate is human beings. And I kind of resonate with that. I feel like if I was ever to turn evil, I'd be pretty similar to Sinsui. But my number one Tagashi villain, and I guess it's uh, arguable if you even want to call him a villain, is of course Meruem from the Chimera Ant arc. The journey of Meruem is just always impressive to me. I, I love watching it. I love watching this character that was born destined to, you know, take over the world, eat human beings, whatever the case may be. And he has this existential crisis of not understanding who he is or what he's meant to do and uh, what he finds value in. And he finds value in this human that should be insignificant to him. You know, small, weak, fragile, blind, you know, just like, what is this? This is food. Like, who the fuck is this? And then somehow he's just endeared to Komogi and, and finds her fascinating and wants to play games with her and just like... It's such a beautiful thing that happens throughout the course of his journey. And that's why I say it's like arguable if you want to call him an antagonist. But don't forget, he's murdered tons of people. He's killed parents in front of their children. Like he's, you know, I think he qualifies as a villain. You just might say that like by the time his arc is over, maybe he is no longer. But he never becomes like a hero or anything. He doesn't go on a hero's journey. He's just trying to figure out what he finds valuable in life, you know. Uh, and his fight scene with Netero... 
arguably one of the best fight scenes in any anime ever, not just because of the spectacle. I think the thing that bothers me a lot about modern anime is that like the spectacle of the fight scenes, the animation sometimes takes over the storytelling and uh, is this illusion that the anime is great. But with uh, in Hunter x Hunter, Meruem versus Netero is the animation is great, but the storytelling through that fight is even better. And uh, the finale of Chimera Ant and the the death of Meruem is, I, I I'll be I'll be honest, is probably the only time that uh, I actually did like tear up and cry uh, watching an anime show. You know, uh, it just. It surprised me, and I've never been surprised like that with a with an anime like that, with a with a shonen series like that before or since. And uh, I think it's special, unique, and is the reason why it's my number one. So there you guys go. That is my top ten villains created by Yoshihiro Tagashi uh, throughout Hunter Hunter and Yu Yu Hakusho. And you could tell I had to cheat a couple of times with the the Royal Guard and the Phantom Troop just because there's so many, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, how do you? just craft that many great characters. You could also throw in the other Kakin princes that are, you know, getting darker and darker. There's so many other characters you could include here. But you know what? There is actually one character that I missed that is actually probably my real number one. I think the best villain, even greater than Meruem, that Tagashi has ever created is without a doubt, Tonpa.